So, hello, good morning everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Krzysztof Pasiak. Some of you may know me from a couple of USB related talks, so I may disappoint you. Today I'm not going to talk about USB at all. So if you came here to listen about USB, now you've got time to leave. <laughs> if not, let's go to today's topic. Um, during the last year, I took a part in a project that the main goal was to keep Python as embedded Linux distribution up and running even when we accept some foreign code. Foreign code means that the developer is able to provide their own RPMs to the image and we would like to make the user experience better. It means that we don't want crashes, it means that we don't want resources. Our main target are long-running devices, it means IoT. So long-running devices are kind of similar to the servers. I mean IoT is similar to server. They are all running uh, pretty long. So to solve our problem, to keep our platform up and running, we try to learn from previous experience of server guys. Then we came up with our own solution because it turned out that uh, solutions known from server world are too heavy for our small embedded devices. The whole Tizen image uh, payload for, for the IoT is up to 40 megabytes, so we would like to keep our solution small. Uh, the menu for today is the problem statement, and the solutions known from the server world, our solution, some short summary, and questions. So, what's the problem? To help you understand the problem, I would like to talk about California. Who have ever been in the USA? Raise your hand. Yeah, quite a lot of you. Did you enjoy your visit? I have been a couple of years ago in California. It's a really nice place. It's sunny. It's beautiful. When I went there, I saw a lot of whole houses like this one. The house is big, but what uh, focuses my attention is this beautiful green lawn. I thought, hmm, California seems to be a rather dry place than wet. And to have a green grass, you need a lot of water. So I expected rather lawns like this one. So I thought, hmm, to keep this lawn green, they have to water it a lot, a lot. So it is costly. Then if you are doing this manually, it requires a lot of time. If you automate this, it may be beneficial, but it has, you have to do some initial investment. So I talked with some guy from California. I asked him, hmm, man, how are you doing this? How are you keeping your lawn so green? He answered me, we are just painting them. <laughs> they are just painting their loans because they know that user experience is important. Their houses are like showcases. So when you come to someone's house and you see a beautiful green loan, you know that this house is beautiful. When you see a loan like from the previous picture, when it's really dry, you say, oh my gosh, it could do this better. And the same is with software. Our products are being bought using eyes, mostly eyes. So what's the most important is user experience, UI. But not only, because performance can influence your product and reliability. User don't want your device, your product to hang. And he would like to move it smoothly you would like uh, your product to be ready to use every time. So how to do this? To ensure, uh, to ensure that your project is running smoothly, that your product is um, well recognized by user, you have to put some efforts into development. In our case, we are not providing a product. Our product is free. Our product is called Linux Distribution. It ties an operating system. So, as I said, Tizen Image is customizable. 
It means that you may log into the web server and choose which feature you would like to include in your image. And then you may also add some custom RPMs. We don't know what you are adding to your image. We don't know what's your use case. We don't know if your code is of good quality. So, all in all, you end up with a platform where pieces of code are, comes from us. And we may say that they are pretty good, or they come from open source project, and we can say that they are really nice. And then we may say that you are uploading some foreign code, and we have no idea about the quality of this code. But in the end, you may always place a sticker on your product and say, hey, I'm running Python. It doesn't matter that to tens of our good services, you add some crap. You may always say, I'm running Python. So, the first piece of to have a good piece of code, you need to have a well defined, a good software development <laughs> process, like in open source. You've got code review, you've got tests. But there is a question how long are you testing your product? <laughs> how long are you testing your software? Are you testing your software running for a year? Not really. Usually, you just run some unit tests and see, okay, it's working, so it should be working also for a year long. It's not always a true. You need some continuous integration, and you need some static analysis to improve your code quality. But even if you put all the stuff in place, your code is going to be imperfect. Take a look at on the Linux kernel. There is a lot of efforts a lot of reviewers, but there are still bugs. It doesn't mean that you can throw the stuff to trash bin and stop using this. No, no, no. This is not what I'm trying to tell you. Please keep this in place. But remember that even if your process is really well defined, that you put a lot of efforts, your software may be imperfect. This means that it requires monitoring. And this is what server guys really know. So the second piece of code is the foreign code, the one you upload to the platform. And we have no idea if it has been reviewed at all, have you tested or not. You are just uploading this to the image. So it even more requires monitoring during the runtime. So what kind of problems we may encourage? There are memory leaks, file descriptor leaks, bugs, in terms of bugs, I mean everything which may call you, uh, which may uh, make your service behave unexpectedly, which may make your server crash. There are some boot loops. If you try to reboot your platform, then you may enter some boot loop. It's common, especially uh, during updates, uh, or many other. So it means that our solution has to be extendable uh, to allow you to customize your monitoring infrastructure. So how to fix those problems in a runtime? So we may try to restart service from time to time. It may, it's also a common practice from a server world that hmm, my web server seems to be running fine for around a day, but then it starts using all the RAM memory. So how to fix this? Well, you should go to the code and fix it. But then you open the code base and you say, oh my gosh, it means line of code. I'm not going to find the bug here. Okay, so let's just reset it every day. Then you may have some fixed scripts because services may also corrupt its data. So you have some simple fixer, not change inside the service code itself, but change some script that's going to fix the database or something. You may have the recovery mode. It means that you may have a separate initramfs when you can where you can boot and in some well prepared, well defined <laughs> environment try to fix your problem. In the end, or maybe firstly, you should report the bug to the developer. It's important to not only restart the service, but also let the developer, the one who wrote this piece of code, know that hey, you've got a bug in your service. You should try to fix it 
so we can upload the be better version for the next release. And of course, any other method that you can think about. So, as I told you, keeping platform up and running is a well-known issue in server world. Those guys have really uh, hard contracts for availability of their service, like 99 point and some number of nines uh, percent. So it's really hard to keep your service up and running for such a long period of time. So how they are doing this? The answer is monitoring and service restarting. The first method which helps us keep our service up and running is system B. Who is using system B? Yeah, that's like I thought so. So it's common and it's almost free to use. System D provides a couple two nice options uh, to fix your service or at least to restart it. First one is the restart. Uh, it means that system D is going to automatically restart your service based on the conditions you choose. The most common version is to for long long running service to restart the service every time uh, when you enter failed state. Failed state, it means that it has been killed by the signal, it has uh, exited with uh, unclean code or something like this. The other method of fixing the service is to use on failure option. On failure is a unit which will be automatically started by system D when a service fails. So instead of simply restarting the service, we are running some kind of uh, fixing script or some kind of developer notification mechanism, something like this. But it's not enough for server guys. That's why there are some more extensive monitoring tools like Nachips. I think it's the one of the most popular uh, solution. So the core part of this software is scheduler and web interface. Why we need a scheduler? Well, the very basic principle of Nagios is to run some script every 10 minutes, every one hour, or every minute to check the status of the service. We just check the status and collect the result in our database. If the service is failed, or for example, uh, some server is not responding for the ping message, we are changing our state. There are five different states. And during this change, we are generating an event. This event may be handled by some event handlers. Usually, event handler is a simple shell script that is going to do the job. So for example, if you do the ping test of some server, you may try to uh, handle the fact that it went from the OK state to soft critical. It means that server is down. So you write a, so a shell script that is going to do the power cycle on the server to reboot it and try to uh, keep it up and running and ob obviously notify the administrator that something is wrong with that machine. The other way of checking the status is passive checks. In terms of classic plugins, I mean classic scripts which are checking the state, they are being run uh, by the Nagios itself every n minutes. Passive checks are kind of different because it's an independently running script or a service that submits the status when it would like to do this or when the status is changed. So for example, uh, if you would like to trace the amount of RAM memory used but only with 100 megabytes resolution, you may report the status to the Nagios only when uh, passing 100 megabytes uh, of RAM usage, not every one megabyte change or not every 10 minutes. What's the disadvantage of uh, active checking is that you have no idea what happened between the checks. So you've got a 10 minute gap for your measurement. Itinga is a kind of fork of Nagios uh, and it has been created to be more distributed. There, may, there are multiple nodes set up, separate databases, etc. People say that it's, they're both equivalent, but 
I think that this one is much more prepared for being distributed. But it's still very heavy. It provides quite a similar functionality. Oh, it has additional mobile clients. So it doesn't matter for us because we are doing some embedded stuff. The next one is Zapdos. What's different in, uh, from our perspective is that it has much more events and it has a rule engine. In Nagios and Itinga, you just say that if state of this check changes from OK to soft or to, crit uh, to soft critical or to soft warning, then execute the script. Over here, you may write a rule that will combine status of multiple services, of multiple checks, and execute the script, for example, only if five or ten services is done, not only one. So in Azure, you have only piece of state, and here you may consider the state of whole system, of all checks. But it's still really heavy. So in general, Server monitoring tools are really good. In addition, they are web scale, like the MongoDB. So, it's a really good piece of software, but not tailored for embedded needs. That's why we just couldn't take it and fit this in your pocket. But we needed to develop something which, which is small. First of all, we did all those stuff as a central decision-making point. It may be distributed among multiple nodes, but all the devices, all the checks are being uploaded to, to some cloud, to some kind of central, central server. We don't want to make a decision about your devices. We don't want to collect your data. So we would like your, your product, we would like your service to be independent. That's why we don't want to keep the state on some remote machine, but on your product itself. So it's a single monitor, a single machine monitoring, no web interface, the delays should be low, and we should not uh, set any pooling interval. So we focused on passive changes, for example, service file failing, uh, change of number of file descriptor or something, instead of executing uh, they check every n minutes. Why? Because it's more power efficient to make the check only when the status is checking. We tried to make some measurements and it turned out that most of our IoT devices are usually idle. So it means that they are in deep sleep state and there is no point in waking them up every 10 minutes or every 5 minutes or every 1 hour just to check the status which didn't change. So, what we have developed? We created a default D. From our perspective, it's a generic event processing framework. It consists of single daemon, which has, as usual, input and output. Input is a change of state in the system. For example, system D may notify us that some service failed. So this is our input. It's captured by some listener, and reported as an event to the core. Every event that goes through the core is being saved into the database for further analysis. Then, we put it to the decision maker. What is decision maker? Decision maker is a business logic that decides what you should do in this case. It may contact the database, check the history. It may contact some external server, it may show user pop-up or anything or uh, send push notification to some mobile phone or something. It doesn't matter. Fold D is a plugin architecture, so may, you may write decision maker on your own. When the decision is made, so we now know what we should do. There are implementation of actions. Currently, we've got only four actions. Restart the service, recover the service, reboot, and reboot to recover it. Because implementation of this action may vary between different platforms, between different devices, they are kind of abstract. So the business logic only decides what kind of action should be taken, and this part 
decide which implementation should be used. So what kind of listener do we have now? First of all, it's systemd listener. It's subscribe on private systemd bus. Well, why? Why private? Because dbus daemon is a service. To be more precise, it's a critical service for our platform because most of our services is using dbus for communication. So we don't want to get notification from systemd via dbus daemon. We want to get this notification directly. So we use the private systemd bus which doesn't involve uh, any other daemon for communication. So systemd may send us a signal whenever some service failed. When we got the signal, we are reporting events even to the core and then run our business logic to decide what we should do with this service. Another type of listener is audit listener. Why do we use audit listener? Because we would like to keep resource usage uh, on, let's say, we would like to catch uh, resource leaks like file descriptor leaks, like memory leaks. So for every service on our, on our platform, we set the memory limits, the max file descriptor limits, all the standard error limits. Then we use audit syscall to catch the moment when service gets some error message from a suitable uh, syscall. And then uh, we report this to the core and decide what to do. Uh, with that service. What's important here that this solution is not perfect because service gets an error. As you know, handling error in services, especially errors which are uncommon, like EM file. Who have ever get an EM file error in his service? Please raise your hand. Okay, so not, not so many people. So you see that it's not common. That's why error handling path are not well tested and usually they contain bugs. The perfect solution would be to get a notification that service hits some resource usage level um, without returning an actual error to the service itself. Apart from this, it turned out that for our platform, Audit Cisco is not free. It's rather expensive. Because if you use Audit Cisco, this slows down your open Cisco for a 33% for a for a cold file and up to 45% for hot file. Hot file means that the file is already cached uh, in inode that you cache. So that's why we develop error limit events. Uh, which are lightweight mechanism of notification to user space when service reaches a uh, given amount of resource usage. So we measure this and it's 5.6% for hot file and 1.6% for, for uh, cold file. Unfortunately, after I developed an, and post an RFC, I have been moved to other projects. So if there is someone who would like to pick up those patches, feel free to do this and try to mainline them. Uh, the next part of fold D is decision maker. Currently we've got three of them just to, for a showcase. First one is VIP process handler. Uh, VIP process is for example Dbus daemon. When Dbus daemon dies, there is nothing to do on this system. So it's time to reboot. The standard recovery means that if some service fails n times, it's being recovered. Recovered means that if it defines some recovery script, we are running it. If not, we are simply restarting the service. After n, after n times of recovering the service, we are doing n reboots. When we detect a reboot loop, we are entering the recovery and maybe sending some push mes message to the phone, hey, something is wrong with your IoT device, try to check it. The last one is decision maker for resource violation. Resource violation means messages from Audi or from error limit events. If we detect that some service has resource violation, we may generate a report for the developer, send 
hey, you, your service is using much more resources than your declared, you should take a look at this. And then we are restarting a service. Actions, like I told you, we've got to recover the service, it means run the recovery unit and restart the service, uh, simple restart, reboot, and we've got three different types of reboot. The first one is forced, we just use the syscall. The second one is reboot, reboot using systemd. Once again, we use private bus uh, to talk with it. And the last one is Tizen specific, because on Tizen, platform is being reviewed, rebooted using deviced. And because the last one is unreal, uh, not reliable, we are trying to use it, and then if it fails, we just go to the previous option. The last one is Reboot to Recovery. It's simply pretty the same as Reboot, but with some special parameter, which makes Tizen reboot in a recovery mode and uh, the separate in from a test. The last part is database. Like I told you, every event is stored in the database. Why? Because FoldD is a daemon that is running as a root. Fold D is a demo that is rebooting, rebooting your platform. So, as a user and as a developer, I would really want to know who is rebooting my platform and why. So that's why we uh, decided that every event, every action should be traceable from beginning to the end. So every event that is reported by our listener is as a trigger stored in the database. Then when the decision is made, it is also stored in the database and log from executing every action. So for example, we failed to contact device D and we are using system D reboot or something like this, it's also stored inside the database. This allows you to implement a decision maker which not only checks the current state of the system, but check also the previous action. So we can, for example, detect these reboot loops. Initially, for our implementation of database backend, we choose EJDB. It's kind of objective uh, database uh, without external demo. It's really fast, but it turned out that it's not efficient in terms of storage. Not only in terms of storage for the database itself, because initially the database may be tailored to one megabyte, but the problem is that EJDB binary together with Tokyo Cabinet algorithm which is used, takes around 700 kilobytes. And it turned out to be too big for our platform. So that's why we are switching now to SQLite, which is, uh, let's say, the default implementation which we used was around 10 times, uh, 10 times slower, but after changing and tweeting uh, the database schematic, uh, we reach only two times, uh, two times you know what? <laughs> Sorry, I'm mean, not native English speaker. Uh, okay, so summary. How does fold D itself look like? You've got the system D notification, our input to system D listener and to audit listener from the Linux kernel. What's important here is that before fold D, we didn't use audit on our platform, so we eliminated the audit D demo. Why? Because it was slow because it took some space and because no one other used it. So there was no reason to keep it. We are di like directly listening messages from, from the audit. Then we've got the core part, which is simply a routing for the events, uh, database, actions, and decision makers. So summary, what we learned during this year. First of all, <laughs> server monitoring tools are really useful. If you've got your own server, try to install and play with them. There is a lot of benefits. You may see uh, what your server is really doing. It's important not only in terms of kind of full tolerance or painting your grass green. It's important in terms of security. Because like my friend told me, in internet, there is no machines that does nothing. All machines which are connected to the internet may be subjected to attacks and be used, for example, to mine a Bitcoin. 
So if you are using IoT devices, remember to monitor also them. Because you know the botnet Mirai? Who heard about it? Yeah, cool. So, so you know what you can use those IoT devices for. Unfortunately, those tools are too big for small embedded platforms. That's why we developed Fold, Fold D. We try to keep it generic. So if it fits your use case, it's great. Try to use it. It's available free and open source, available at jig.tizen.org. If it doesn't fit your use case, try to develop some plugins. It should be easy. Uh, maybe it would be better than writing everything from scratch. The next one is that Audit Cisco is not free. Why it's kind of surprising? Because a lot of server is using Audit to trace activity on the server. But it turned out that on ARM platform, Audit Cisco is much slower than on x86. On x86, it's around uh, 5 to 10 percent. So on ARM, it's three time, at least three times uh, slower than on x86. EJDB is pretty fast, so if you need a fast objective database for your platform, try to use it. Unfortunately, you have to have some spare storage uh, for both library and the database. And that's all. Questions? Yeah? Well, Foldy is not using any distributed. The goal is that Fold D should operate independently. It means that we don't want to have some central point of decision. We don't want to have some central cloud to collect the, the information. We want only reports about uh, resource violations or about some, some attacks. But it's up to the manufacturer because we are releasing this image. Oh, sorry, I yeah. been on the day. What sort of things? What sort of things? Um, probably some kind of IoT gateways. But of, obviously it depends how you configure your image. That, that's why I mentioned that there is a web configurator and you can put anything on this. Some more? Yeah? Um, we didn't need to handle C groups. Uh, because C groups V1 already provided uh, a kind of that functionality, at least in terms of memory C groups. Yeah, but to uh, report violations of C groups, you know, We didn't develop uh, such plugin, uh, we didn't develop such a listener, but we've been testing this uh, for C groups, and like I told you, for the memory C group, there was a functionality similar to error limit events. It means that you can subscribe and get notification when C group is using some specific amount of memory. So it's really cool, but it has been dropped in C groups V2. Some more questions? Yeah? Am I familiar with Kios Monkey? No, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, so just to, to repeat, uh, Kios Monkey seems to be a system that uh, is randomly shutting down some servers just to check if they are able to recover. I'm not available, uh, maybe I'm not aware of this solution and we didn't try to use it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the question is uh, if we evaluate money for this. Uh, we tried to evaluate money, but it also didn't fit. But I didn't mention about this because it's kind of similar to the other stuff. So all the server tools uh, are, let's say, common. They have some different features, but the overall idea itself is quite common. We don't have a scheduler here, we don't have packet checks, 
we are using just uh, passive checks, just signals from the system. Any other questions?